Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining tonight. It is a digital full house. Um, for the first time in our history of online events, we have capped the Zoom. There are 100 people online live with us right now, which is fantastic. So thank you for joining. And this isn't even our regular meeting night. This is a special presentation um, uh, we have for you this evening, uh, given an upcoming solar eclipse in our area. Howard Simcover has very generously offered to um, give this presentation tonight. He's also asked me to keep this short. Now, the reason why you know, it's full, I think is obvious. Um, we, uh, we've we had many presentations from Howard in the past. Um, and while I am very proud of the um, events and the presentations that we have in general um, as part of the programming at the OFNC, and I think we do a good job, when Howard shows up, he eclipses everybody else. So, sorry, I had to. Um, <laughs> But it's also true, um, uh, Howard, if you don't know, is um, he's a professional engineer. He graduated from McGill. He has given many presentations over the years with the Royal Astronomical Society and the Montreal Planetarium. He's lectured at um, Carleton. He's lectured and uh, other places. He's given many of these presentations to us um, as requested. I'll uh, keep it there. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome digitally to Howard Simcover. Well, thank you, Jacob. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. And I'm so glad to see all of you here tonight on my screen. It's my pleasure to spend this time with you sharing my passion for eclipses of the sun. So we'll get right into it. I will share my screen. And here we go. So it's March the 4th, and we're going to look at celestial shadows, eclipses of the sun. I think uh, many of you who know me, you know that my interest in astronomy goes back literally to when I was seven years old. And I've always been fascinated with eclipses of the sun. And the good news is that a total solar eclipse is coming to Canada, in particular to Eastern Canada, as well as much of North America on April the 8th of 2024. It's a Monday afternoon. The last total solar eclipse in Canada was in Manitoba on February 26th of 1979, more than 40 years ago. I was actually there in Gimli, Manitoba, and I saw that eclipse in a beautiful clear sky in around minus 10 degrees Celsius. It was actually a fairly warm winter day for southern Manitoba. The next total solar eclipse in Canada will be a sunset eclipse in BC and Alberta in August of 2044. So more than 20 years from now. So this opportunity on April 8th is something that is not to be missed. Now, tonight I've got three segments to this presentation. I'm going to talk about eclipses, the context, the history, the geometry of them, give you some examples of eclipses from my own personal experience, a bit of a personal journey, you might say, and we will then talk about the upcoming eclipse of April the 8th, how you as members of the Field Naturalist Club can safely observe this wonderful event and enjoy it in literally about four to five weeks from now. I'd like to say that eclipses are about alignments and shadows. And these alignments happen in our skies for a very special reason. It's because most objects in our solar system are orbiting the sun in nearly the same geometric plane. So to get a better sense of this, we'll step back and step outside the solar system and look back at the family of planets orbiting the sun. 
So here we are looking down at the solar system from an angle. You can see the planets orbiting the sun. When I was growing up, we learned there were nine planets, but I'm sure as most of you know, in 2006, the planet Pluto was demoted into a dwarf planet. So now we only have eight official planets orbiting the sun. But if we look at the solar system, not from an angle above it, so to speak, but edge on, we get a very interesting view. We can see that the orbits of the planets generally are very similar to the plane of the orbit of the Earth. The planet Mercury is a bit of a maverick. Its orbit is tilted or inclined at an angle of about seven degrees. But most of the orbits of the planets and most of the orbits of the moons of those planets, we could fit more or less into a tabletop. And that situation is what leads to these alignments in the sky. So let me give you a couple of examples. Here's a picture I took from the roof of my condominium here in Sandy Hill in February of 1999. You can see Parliament in the distance in the west, just uh, down to the bottom. I no longer get that view because some apartment buildings have grown up in between. But if you look in the upper portion of this image, you see two very bright objects very close together. And those are the planets Venus and Jupiter. It's a conjunction or an alignment. And here is a more recent example, also taken from the roof of my condominium. This is in May of 2022 at dawn, around quarter to five in the morning. There you see the planet Jupiter and below it, the planet Mars. So these are alignments that happen because the planets are orbiting in more or less the same plane. So if objects in the solar system can align in the sky as we see them, it means that their shadows can also fall upon each other and cross one another. This is the planet Jupiter as seen through a rather large telescope. And you'll notice at the left, there are two little objects. These are two of the roughly 80 moons of Jupiter. And these moons are casting their shadows onto the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. You see those little black spots on the upper atmosphere. And it means that if you were there inside literally one of those black spots, you would see these moons covering up the sun, you would be experiencing a total solar eclipse. But as we'll see shortly, eclipses on the Earth are much more interesting and much more dramatic than the solar eclipses we get on other planets of the solar system. Eclipses of the sun for us are caused by the shadow of our own moon falling onto the Earth. The moon is a fairly small object compared to the Earth, although in terms of the relative size, the moon can be thought of as being a large moon in comparison to the moons of other planets. But it's about a quarter the diameter of the Earth. And for the mathematically inclined, we know that volume goes up with the cube of the radius. So we could fit around 64 moons inside the Earth. But through an amazing coincidence, and it is just a coincidence, the sun is about 400 times larger than the moon. And on average, the sun is also about 400 times farther away than the moon. Now, because of this coincidence, we get this, that when you put the sun and the moon together in the sky, they appear to be almost exactly the same size. They subtend an angle of about one half of one degree. And it means if the alignment is right, and if the moon 
passes in front of the sun, it appears barely large enough, but just big enough in apparent size to cover the sun completely. And through that geometry, it also means that the shadow of the moon is barely able to reach all the way to the surface of the Earth. Now, there's two types of solar eclipses I'll talk about tonight. There's actually four in total, but I will only talk about two. And we'll start with the total eclipse of the sun. Now, to give you just a taste of what the experience is like, for those of you who have not seen one yet, I'm going to show you some pictures that my wife and I took in northern Australia in 2012. And we went there specifically for a solar eclipse, which was occurring just after sunrise. Now, it starts very slowly. The moon moves very gradually across the face of the sun. And from the southern hemisphere, it seems to go from left to right. It takes a bit over an hour as the moon gradually encroaches on the face of the sun. And then in the last minute or so, when the sun is nearly covered, that's when it starts to get exciting and dramatic and beautiful and stunning. What you saw there was a series of pictures taken with longer and longer exposures that bring out this beautiful view of the sun's corona, the atmosphere of the sun, which stretches outward more than two million miles from the surface of the sun. And you can see here the structure in the corona, which is easily visible to the naked eye and with binoculars during totality. You see rays coming out through the corona, which are following the magnetic field of the sun. A beautiful and wonderful sight that only lasts a few minutes during totality. So what's really happening here is that this long conical shadow of the moon is reaching all the way down to the surface of the earth. The moon is traveling in its orbit, moving at around 4,000 kilometers per hour. And so the shadow touches the Earth during the eclipse and traces out this very narrow path that we call the path of totality. The path is never more than around 200 kilometers in diameter. It's very, very narrow. Now, it's true that in a wider region, you can see a partial eclipse. The sun will be partially covered, but only in that very narrow path will you get totality, where the sun is completely covered as the shadow of the moon passes over you. The shadow is moving very quickly near the edge of the Earth due to the geometry, so that would be over here. The shadow is moving at something like seven to 8,000 kilometers per hour. And only in the central portion of the path here does it uh, slow down to perhaps three to 4,000 kilometers per hour, but much too fast for a jet airliner to keep up with it. Only a supersonic aircraft can keep pace with the shadow of the moon. Now, that is a real picture. It's taken from a spacecraft looking down at the moon shadow over Europe in August of 1999. And in that spot of darkness, which is around 200 kilometers in diameter, people were experiencing a total eclipse of the sun. Unfortunately, through most of Europe, it was cloudy. 
but the shadow moved over to Turkey. And there you see my wife and I, she's wearing the red t-shirt. I'm in the blue t-shirt. And that's my cousin Greg on the ground looking up at the eclipse through a filter. You'll see that the sky was perfectly clear. We had a wonderful view of that eclipse in August of 1999. I mentioned that the path of the eclipse is never more than around 200 kilometers wide. So there's a northern edge and a southern edge. The shadow, as it sweeps over the Earth, tends to be elliptical, depending on the slant angle of the moon shadow as it reaches down and touches the Earth. I think it's obvious that where you want to be is somewhere near the central line, as we call it, somewhere near the middle of the path, because then the shadow will take the longest period of time to pass over you. If you're right near the edge of the path, you will get totality, but it's very brief. So you want to be somewhere near the central line. That's the objective. The shadow moves very quickly, and so the shadow will pass over you in one or two or three or four minutes. Theoretically, an eclipse can last as long as seven minutes and 30 seconds. But eclipses of more than seven minutes totality are extremely rare, and the next one won't happen until the year 2186. I'm planning to have myself frozen, and I'd like to come back and see that one off the coast of Brazil. So a question that we can ask is, are these things really as rare as they're cracked up to be? And you might have found an answer if you were listening to CBC Radio News on December 19th, because this is what they said. She's one of the most famous performers on the planet. But Celine Dion's sightings seem more rare than an eclipse. Well, maybe, but maybe not. So the real answer is yes and no as to whether they are really very rare. If you stay in any one place, like Ottawa or Phoenix, Arizona or Calgary, Alberta or Paris, France, you will wait on average around 360 years between times that the moon's shadow passes over you, 360 years for any one particular place. But if you're willing to travel, not only within North America, but across the Earth as a whole, you can actually experience a total eclipse of the sun roughly every one and a half years. After this one in April, there will be one in Spain in August of 2026. And then a year later, another one in the Mediterranean and the Middle East in August of 2027. Just as some people travel every four years to the Olympics, there's a whole community of rather peculiar people, one of whom is myself, who travel very often to see total eclipses of the sun. It's a wonderful way to plan your vacation thousands of years in advance, is what I say. Now, an eclipse of the sun can only happen at a special time of the month, and that's the time of new moon. So we won't spend a lot of time on the geometry here, but I know that you're all aware the moon travels around the Earth in 29 and a half days. And as it does, because it presents a different geometry to us with respect to the sunlight, that's coming from the right-hand side of the image, we see the moon go through phases, a crescent to a first quarter to a full moon, and so on. Now, if you consider the first quarter moon, and that's when we see the moon that is exactly half lit, obviously because the sunlight is coming from the right, the shadow of the moon is nowhere near the Earth. You can't get an eclipse there. It's only when the moon is new, when it's between the Earth and the sun, that its shadow can fall onto the surface of the Earth. But it doesn't happen every month. 
It doesn't happen at every new moon. And that's because the orbit of the moon is tilted or inclined to the orbit of the Earth by a little over five degrees. So this is what it looks like if we consider the geometry. The orbit of the moon is tilted 5.2 degrees to the plane of the orbit of the Earth. And if we come in a little bit closer and look at this situation, so if we are on the Earth and we look towards the sun like this, and then we look towards the moon, we have to look downward at an angle, in this case, of five degrees. So if you consider the situation here, which is what we see in the sky, we see the moon miss the sun. It passes below the sun and there is no eclipse. And on other occasions, the moon will pass above the sun. You need a very special circumstance to get an eclipse. And that's where you need the Earth and the moon in the points of their orbits where the orbital planes intersect in three dimensions. Now that situation actually happens twice per year, every six months. But even then, you're not guaranteed to get a total eclipse. You'll get some kind of an eclipse, but it might be a partial eclipse. And as I mentioned before, on average, you'll only get that very special circumstance of the total eclipse on average every 18 months or so. Now, people who lived thousands of years ago in the Mesopotamian or the Egyptian civilizations, they had astronomers. They were very well aware of eclipses of the sun and eclipses of the moon. They knew what was happening. They were perfectly aware that during a total solar eclipse, it was not a monster or a dragon that was eating the sun. We've all heard these stories and these myths. They were perfectly aware it was the moon covering the sun, but they were unable to make accurate predictions of when and where eclipses would happen. In fact, this was done for the very first time on a very accurate level by our friend Edmund Halley a bit over 300 years ago, and that's the same Edmund Halley who gave his name to the comet that we're all aware of. Halley was living at a time long before digital computers, long before even mechanical calculators. And yet, using hand calculations and very accurate observations of the position of the moon and understanding the geometry of the Earth-Moon system and how it related to the position of the sun in the sky, Halley was able to make this map of the path of the moon shadow over the Earth on May 3rd of 1715. And that total eclipse passed right over southern England. Now, amazingly, 300 years ago, with these hand calculations, he was able to calculate the edge of the path of totality to within about five miles astonishingly accurate, and maybe even more astonishing, on May 3rd of 1715 over England, it was clear. And so huge numbers of people in the population experienced a total eclipse of the sun. Here's a map that shows some eclipse tracks over North America in the middle part of the 20th century. It's not showing all of them, it's showing some of them. Now here is the track of the eclipse of Saturday, March 7th, 1970. You see it comes up over Florida, the Carolinas, comes all the way up and crosses Nova Scotia, where it was cloudy, and over Newfoundland, where it was cloudy, and then just two years later, on July 10th, 1972, it was a Monday afternoon, another eclipse occurs. The track comes down over Hudson's Bay, northern Quebec, and also crosses 
eastern Nova Scotia. And both times it was cloudy in Nova Scotia, unfortunately. But that eclipse of July 10th, 1972 is very famous. The reason it's famous is that a few months after the eclipse, a song was released by Carly Simon. I'm sure you know the song. You're probably thinking of some of the words in your head right now, just the way I am. And it was rumored for many years that when she sang You're So Vain, that she was singing about the actor Warren Beatty, with whom she had had a romantic relationship. In fact, 40 years went by, and it was only around 2012 or 13 that Carly revealed she was in fact writing about Warren Beatty, but the song was also about two other men. So it was a sort of amalgam of three men that she felt were vain. Well, let's listen to a few bars of the song and we'll see where the eclipse comes in. And indeed, flying that Learjet was probably the only way to see that eclipse from Nova Scotia. All the people on the ground, unfortunately, were clouded out. Eclipses have also found their way into books and movies. There are many examples. I'm going to talk about only one of them, and it's the one at the bottom. Now, I'm sure many of you have read books by the American author who lives in the state of Maine, Stephen King. Stephen King has written many mystery and horror books. I read The Pet Cemetery. I read the book It that was also made into a movie. And he wrote a book called Dolores Claiborne, made into a movie in 1995. I mentioned that Stephen King has always lived in the state of Maine. And there was a total eclipse of the sun on July 20th, 1963, that passed over Quebec and down over the state of Maine. And this eclipse figured prominently in the movie version of Dolores Claiborne. And it was beautiful, but it didn't last six and a half minutes. That's Hollywood. That eclipse over Maine was more like two minutes and 30 seconds. Now, here are other eclipse tracks over the world in the latter part of the 20th century. I'm going to point out something very interesting to you about the geometry. Take a look at the eclipse track of March 7th, 1970. Notice that to the left, 18 years later, on March 17th, 1988, there's another total eclipse. This time it's over the Pacific Ocean. Notice the shape of the track of that eclipse. And notice that it's just about identical to the shape of the track of March 7th, 1970. Now, this is not an accident. There is an underlying geometric and mathematical truth here. This is because the sun and the moon appear to repeat a pattern in the sky. The pattern is 18 years, 11 days, and eight hours. And in that period, the sun and the moon come back to almost exactly the same position in the sky. Edmund Halley gave it a name. He called it the Saros cycle. And what it means is that from one Saros to the next, you get another eclipse, but the eclipse is shifted a third of the way around the Earth. So why one third? It's because of the eight hours. In that eight hour period, the Earth makes one third of a 24 hour spin. So you get another eclipse, but it's a third of the way around the Earth towards the West. So again, you might ask this question, 
if a Saros is about 18 years, why don't we have to wait 18 years between eclipses? The answer is because there are many of these Saros cycles, between 40 and 45 of them, that are occurring at the same time. This is Saros number 139. All the Saros cycles have been given numbers. This one has 71 eclipses in the entire series. It started with a partial eclipse at the North Pole in 1501, and it will end 1,262 years later with a partial eclipse near the South Pole in 2763. So I'd like you to think about that for a moment. Think of the span of time we are dealing with when we're talking about these cycles. And there are around 45 of these cycles going on at the same time. Here are four successive eclipses in that Saros. And you'll see now very clearly why I am showing this to you. One eclipse was on March 7th, 1970 in Mexico, the US and Nova Scotia. 18 years later, the eclipse happens again, a third of the way around the earth in the Philippines and Indonesia. 18 years, 11 days, eight hours later, there's another eclipse over Africa and the Middle East. And then 18 years, 11 days, eight hours after that one, the eclipse comes back to North America in the cycle on Monday afternoon, April the 8th, and it will again cross Mexico, the US and Eastern Canada. I had the definite honor of being at the three previous eclipses in this Saros, and I saw them all in clear skies. So here is the track of March 7th, 1970. There's the track of March 18th, 1988 over the Philippines. There's the track over Africa and the Middle East in March of 2006. And then the eclipse comes back to North America with the track on April 8th of 2024. So there I am in black and white film in Elizabeth City, North Carolina in March 1970, on the island of Davao in the Philippines in March of 88, and my wife Louise and I in the Libyan Sahara Desert on March 29th, 2006. So I'm looking forward to April the 8th to my fourth eclipse in the same Saros for my own rendezvous in this cosmic alignment every 18 years, 11 days, and eight hours. So here's a summary of all of these ideas. And I hadn't mentioned this, but a number of these images are going to be provided to all of you in a handout. I will be sending this handout, it's a PDF file to Jacob, and it will be posted on the Field Naturalist website. So here's the summary. You only get a solar eclipse at new moon, but the tilt of the moon's orbit means you don't get an eclipse every month. Eclipses repeat in this Saros cycle of 18 years, 11 days and change. The successive eclipses in the Saros are shifted a third of the way around the planet towards the west. There's around 45 of these Saros cycles happening at the same time. So if you're willing to travel, you can see a total eclipse of the sun somewhere on the earth on average about every 18 months. So we're going to now go to the second segment of what I'm talking about tonight, and we'll look at some personal examples. The last total solar eclipse was 11 months ago. April 20th, 2023, in Exmouth, Western Australia. There you see the eclipse track. It's extremely narrow. The path was 40 kilometers wide at the widest. And you see it just barely, barely touched a little peninsula on the coast of Western Australia at the town of Exmouth. So my wife and I flew to Australia. Here we are in Perth. 
I was in Perth many, many years ago when it was a much smaller place. And I was stunned to see that it's a huge metropolis now with giant skyscrapers. I was just amazed. On the morning of April 20th, 4 a.m., here we are at Perth Airport, getting ready to board a charter aircraft. So this aircraft was going to fly us 1,000 kilometers north to the town of Exmouth into the path of the eclipse. Absolutely everything depended on this aircraft. If the airplane had been delayed, if there were a mechanical problem, we would have been stuck in Perth, a thousand kilometers outside the path, and we would have missed the eclipse. But everything went like clockwork. The plane took off, we landed at Exmouth, and we proceeded to the eclipse site on the shores of the Indian Ocean. Notice that the sky has a few clouds, but very few. The sky was very clear. We had around one and a half thousand people at this site, setting up tripods and telescopes, getting ready for the eclipse. Here's my wife, Louise, using a filter to look at the partially eclipsed sun. We're going to talk about this quite a bit a little bit later. It's absolutely critical to use a filter when any portion of the sun is not covered by the moon. The only time you can look safely at the eclipse is during totality, when it's absolutely safe to look directly at the solar corona and even to look at the sun in binoculars. But when any portion of the sun is uncovered, you must use a filter. So here's Louise and a few words of what she said. So it's Louise. I'm in Exmouth, Australia, and I'm about to see apparently total eclipse number seven for me. And uh, we're by the Indian Ocean, which I think is very romantic. And everybody here is very busy like a bee, observing each other and observing what's happening in the sky. And it's a very good place to be. And yes, it was a very good place to be. And you can hear the hubbub and the noise of being with one and a half thousand people observing an eclipse. So here is the equipment that I used. Notice the filter on the end of the telephoto lens used during the partial phases. Notice the eclipse t shirt which I bought many years ago at another Australian eclipse. By the way, if you want to buy an eclipse t-shirt for April the 8th, they're selling now for something like $30 a pop. On April the 9th, the day after the eclipse, I think the price will come down by 50%. And a week later, you might be able to get them for one or $2. So that's a word to the wise. Here is one of my pictures taken through the filter. So the sun is almost completely covered. And you must remember, as totality begins, to take the filter off the camera. Friends of mine, some of whom are very experienced and have been to five or 10 eclipses, in all the excitement, some of them have left the filter on during totality. And of course, they did not get a single good picture. You must take it off as the sun is covered. So I took the filter off. The eclipse begins. Totality begins. So there's the moon covering the sun. You have the last little bit of sunlight sticking through. That is called the diamond ring effect. We begin to see the corona. Notice here there are jets of hydrogen gas called prominences shooting off the surface of the sun. This one is probably 30,000 miles high. So these are enormous jets of hydrogen. I take a longer exposure and this brings out the beautiful detailed internal structure of the corona. And that's exactly the way it looked to the naked eye and through binoculars. But remember, the path of this eclipse was only 40 kilometers wide. It was a very brief eclipse, 62 seconds. And so 62 seconds after the first diamond ring, 
we get the second diamond ring, we must look away, put the filters back on, and then we get the partial phases. So I'm going to play you a little video. Here I had a GoPro camera pointed at me, and I'm going to ask you to watch carefully the shadow of my tripod here. And as the shadow disappears, that is when totality begins. And watch how the sky gets darker behind me. It happens very quickly. You will hear me call out, the corona is appearing. The corona is out. So here we go. And when you're with a thousand people, that's what it's like, all the emotion and all of the all of the hubbub and clapping and applause at this beautiful and wonderful celestial event. So I mentioned that there's two types of solar eclipses, and we will talk briefly about the other type, the annular eclipse of the sun. The orbit of the moon is not a circle. The orbit of the moon is elliptical. So sometimes the moon is as much as 10% farther away than when it's at its closest distance. When the moon is a little bit farther away, it appears to be a little bit smaller in the sky. And therefore, if it passes across the sun, it's not big enough in apparent size to cover the sun completely. So we get what's called an annular eclipse. It's not as interesting or dramatic as a total eclipse, but it's still worth seeing. This is the geometry. The moon is a bit farther away. The shadow does not quite make it all the way to the Earth. In fact, the tip of the shadow may be as much as 30 to 40,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. If you are directly beneath the moon, you're in the path of annularity. It's not a path of totality. The most recent annular eclipse was in New Mexico in October, five months ago. There is the path across the United States, Central America, and South America. It went just north of Albuquerque. The central line was just north of the city. And here's a close-up of that portion of Albuquerque. There is the eclipse central line you see here. And I was aware there was a very large park within about two kilometers of the central line. So my wife Louise and I traveled there. Here I am in Arroyo del Oso Park. Here we are set up for the annular eclipse. We brought our Canadian flag with us, of course. You'll notice again the filter that is on the camera. And because there is no totality here, a portion of the sun is always visible, you must always use a filter to watch an annular eclipse. Here is one of my pictures of the early partial phases. There you see the sun is largely covered, but you can tell immediately when you look at this that the moon looks a bit too small. It's too small to do the job of covering the sun. The eclipse will not be total. This series of photos I took over a period of just four minutes. The moon enters the disk of the sun and the ring or the annulus begins to form. You get this perfect ring of annularity. And it looks perfect literally for about 15 seconds, that's all. So you have only a few seconds to get that picture. 
the moon continues to move from the top towards the bottom. The ring begins to break, and then the ring breaks. I took a very short video of this, and this is in real time. This is exactly the way it looked. Watch the moon move towards the bottom. The ring begins to break. And that is exactly the way it looked. That was not sped up, that was in real time. Now to show you that not everything always works out the way you would hope, in July of 2009, we got on a ship in Shanghai that was going out to the South China Sea to meet a very long total eclipse of the sun. And this is what happened. Here we are on the deck of the ship. Notice that the sky is completely cloudy. Notice that the decks are wet because it was pouring rain. So nature gives you the eclipse. Nature can take it away. And that's one of the rare examples where we were clouded out. But it happens. I'm going to show you only one more example before we turn to the upcoming eclipse. So we're going back in time over 40 years to 1981. This eclipse was over the old USSR. It was 18 years, 11 days, 8 hours after the Dolores Claiborne eclipse of July 20th, 1963. It's the only time I have ever been to Russia. I would not go there now for the obvious reason of the current international situation. But then I went to the old USSR and I traveled to Siberia. There is the track of the eclipse across the Soviet Union and out in the Pacific Ocean. Here is Bratsk, Siberia, the day before the eclipse. Quite a few clouds in the sky. That was rather concerning. But the next morning, the sun rises into a nearly perfectly clear sky. Here we are at the observation site, a lot of Canadians, some of whom had brought along a very large flag I was happy to see. So there I am. Notice the filter on the camera. Notice there is not a single gray hair on me. That's 43 years ago. At this eclipse, I had the very great honor to meet this person. And who is this, you might ask? Well, this is Wendy Carlos. And even today, 40 years later, she is considered to be one of the best eclipse photographers in the world. She's very famous as well because she is a composer. In the 1960s and 1970s, she worked with the Moog synthesizer, and I was aware of that when I met her. She had released the album Switched on Bach. Some of you may know this album that came out, I think, in 1968. And a few years later, Stanley Kubrick asked her, and she did, compose and play all of the music for the film A Clockwork Orange. So I had the honor to meet with her and chat with her. I met her one more time at an eclipse in 1990 when we were clouded out. And she wrote me this little note, July 23rd, 1990 in Finland, to Howard, better luck next time, Wendy Carlos. But we had a great eclipse in Siberia. Here is the first diamond ring from my photographs, totality. And then the second diamond ring. And notice that you get multiple beads of light. You may often have that either at the beginning and the end of totality. And this is due to valleys and imperfections 
in the limb of the moon so sunlight is shining through. These are called Bailey's beads and are very interesting, but you, you should not look at these directly with the unaided eye, only with a filter. In this case, the camera saw this, but I did not. So now we are going to talk about what is coming and how you as members of the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club and friends can enjoy this wonderful and rare event that is coming to many portions of the United States, to Quebec, Ontario, and the Maritime Provinces. So there is the track of the eclipse over North America. I should uh, say as well that Louise and I will actually be here in Torreon, Mexico. That is where we are going uh, for the eclipse of April the 8th. So we will see it around 15 or 20 minutes, I guess, before the eclipse crosses southern Ontario. There is a close-up of the track over southern Ontario and the Maritime provinces. And we'll zoom in here in a minute. I will show you as well, and this is part of the handout that you will get. This is the expected cloudiness along the path. This is based on averages over many years for early April. So you'll notice that in the United States, the degree of cloudiness is around 50 to 60%. It's a little bit worse in Southern Ontario. It's about 65% chance of cloud or about 35% chance of clear sky. So it's not great, but it's not bad. And if you have mobility and you can move a distance along the path, you may be able to increase that probability from 35% to as much as 50%. And I hope wherever you are on eclipse day that you have clear skies. Here is a close up of the path near Ottawa. So the path of totality is between the green lines. The central line is in upstate New York, and that is the red line. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So you see here, there is Ottawa. Here is Highway 416. Kingston is well within the path. Cornwall is somewhat within the path. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So there, the green line, you see the edge of the path. Now, if you're coming down Highway 416, do not stop in Kentville. Do not stop in Smith Falls. That's not good enough. They are outside the path. You must get further south down to Prescott or Brockville or Thousand Islands or Kingston. You must get to within the path. That's absolutely critical. Now, something else you will need is a safe filter, eclipse glasses. Now, unfortunately, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is sold out but I'm going to give you a number of options. And I'm going to recommend, and I'll say this several times, don't wait, act as soon as possible. The other thing you should not do, you should not do, is what Donald Trump did at the last eclipse over the United States in August of 2017. Here he is with his wife Melania on the balcony of the White House, looking up at the partially eclipsed sun. His aides immediately shouted to him, no, don't do that. They gave him glasses, and he and his family looked at the partially eclipsed sun safely. So that is exactly what you should do. So when the sun is partly covered, which takes about an hour for the moon to move across it, you must use the glasses or a safe filter. Only during totality which depending where you are, maybe one or two or three minutes, that is when you can look directly at the corona without a filter. And it's a wonderful sight to see it that way, mm -hmm. even in binoculars. And then as the sun gradually becomes uncovered, you must 
We are having a bit of feedback there. Perhaps someone needs to mute themselves. Anyway, for the partial phases afterwards, you must use the Eclipse glasses. Now this will be in the handout, and you'll notice that here there are hot links. All you have to do is click on these, and these are places that you can order the Eclipse glasses. But there's even more good news. I found out just on the weekend that some home hardware stores are selling these near the counter for just $3. And my wife also found out that they're going to be available at the Ottawa Public Library. But don't wait, please act quickly, because by early April, maybe by the last week of March, everyone everywhere will be sold out. Something you can do, and we are taking this to Mexico with us, it's a kitchen utensil, and notice that it has a lot of little holes in it. You can use these little holes to project crescent images of the sun onto a piece of cardboard. So that's something I'm going to do. This is a picture I took at an eclipse a number of years ago. I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's in the handout, but it's a great project for young people. You can develop this pinhole camera to project an image of the sun inside a box. This is not for totality. This is for the partially eclipsed sun. You will get this in the handout. And here is the hot link for how to make this pinhole projector. Some other interesting things that you can do. You can look at the way the shadows change as the sun gradually becomes covered. Notice that when the sun is a very thin crescent, the vertical shadows become very sharp, while the horizontal shadows remain fuzzy at the edge. And they become sharp because the sun is becoming a point source of light in the vertical direction, whereas for the horizontal shadows, the sun is still subtending one half degree, causing the fuzziness at the edge of the shadow. During totality, take the time to look around at the sky. Here's a picture I took at the Libyan eclipse in 2006. You are in the middle of the shadow of the moon. So up above you, the sky is a very, very deep blue. You might even be able to see the brightest stars. But the edge of the shadow is 70 or 80 kilometers from you in all directions. So you have a 360 degree sunset color all around you. It's a wonderful thing to see. Look up at the sky and you will see two bright planets if your sky is clear. This is in the handout. Jupiter will be to the upper left of the sun, Venus to the lower right of the sun. Venus is very bright, and you should be able to see it at least five minutes before total eclipse and five minutes after. I know I'm speaking to the Ottawa field naturalists. You can observe animals at the onset of totality and during totality. If you have animals near you, it's fascinating to see how they behave. They often become confused as this nighttime darkness is coming very quickly at an unexpected time. So you may wish to do that. You can also bring a thermometer with you. Here's a graph that I drew based on little measurements I took at an eclipse in 1994. And there will be a very marked and noticeable drop in temperature, possibly as much as five degrees Celsius. So you might want to take your measurements and draw your own graph. You may want to take pictures. Absolutely, you should take pictures. But the best advice I can give you is don't spend the whole time taking pictures. This is a very rare event. Your pictures will look like my pictures, will look like everyone else's pictures. 
please don't spend more than 20 seconds taking pictures. Spend the rest of the time experiencing and taking in the beauty and the emotion of this wonderful and beautiful celestial event. You may never experience this again your entire life. And if you want to learn about how to take pictures, you will get this in the handout. It provides lots of advice. So what can you do to plan? There are lots of things you can do. Totality, remember, is around 325 in the afternoon. You need to get a safe filter. Don't wait, do it now. Decide where you're going to be. Please don't stay in Ottawa. Sure, in Ottawa, we will get here in town 98.5% partial eclipse. But you know, 98.5% is nothing. It is nothing compared to the stunning beauty of totality. Please go into the path. Don't try to drive down Highway 416 at 1 o'clock. You will never make it. There could be 50,000 cars trying to get to the path in the early afternoon. Don't try to get to the central line in upstate New York on the day of the eclipse. You will never get across the border. There could be thousands of cars trying to get there. You might even want to book a hotel, and several friends of mine are doing this, for a place in the path on the night of April 7th. Watch the weather websites and adjust your plans. And remember, the more mobile you are to move east or west along the path as required, the more likely it is you can achieve a good view. And again, you will get this. It's a wonderful website that can help you plan. So good luck. Good luck to you. I hope you see this. I hope you have clear skies. I hope you have a wonderful and memorable eclipse experience on April 8th of 2024, wherever you may happen to be. So we're going to close with a video. I do hope you enjoy this. And I want to give a lot of credit to the people who provided images to this video. Some of them are mine, but many, many of them are from other people. I would like you to look at this with the mindset of this is a rare, stunning, and beautiful event. And that is what I'm hoping the video will convey to you.
And thank you. It really has been a pleasure. You will get key items from this presentation, including all of those websites, and they will be distributed to you. So I will stop the share. And I would be more than happy to take any questions or any comments. So uh, I'm not sure how you want to do this, Jacob. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything in the chat or if people should just unmute themselves and ask. No, nope, people should use the raise your hand feature and we'll pick you in order because there's a lot of people. So if you want to ask verbally, go to your reactions. Um, it's in the bottom. It is the same place where you would applaud and stuff. Let me see. It might be in the more section if you can't find it, the three dots in the menu. Look for reactions. In there, there's a button that says raise your hand. You click that. Your hand will go up. It'll stay up. You don't even have to hold your hand up, and we'll get your question on. We'll start while well, people are considering whether to do that. We'll start with the chat. Um, where did my chat go? There it is, the chat. Okay. So... Um, the first question uh, from earlier in the presentation, what criteria do you use for choosing which eclipse uh, to travel to view? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And uh, I've been to many. I'm almost afraid to tell you how many, so I won't. But obviously, I look at what are the chances of seeing it. So for example, there was an eclipse in Mongolia in March of 1997. And the chances of clear sky were about 5%. I did not go to that one. <laughs> I skipped it. Uh, there was one in Antarctica in 2003. It was fabulously expensive to go to that one. I skipped it. But some friends of mine went. They actually saw it from a chartered airplane and had a great view. But it's very, very expensive. So. I consider what are the chances of seeing it? I consider what is the political situation in the country that is having the eclipse? I consider the cost. And those are the main factors. So uh, my wife and I are going to Mexico. And the reason we're going for the April 8th eclipse there is there's about a 95% chance of clear sky where we're going. And a trip to Mexico is not you know, as expensive as a trip to Antarctica. Those are some of the factors that I consider. And it's a great question. Thank you. All right. I will keep reading from the chat, but it looks like uh, Todd Simcover has a question <laughs> or comment. Oh, sorry. I was uh, unmuting. Hello. Uh, great presentation. Thank and, you. Uh, Howard is my uncle. Is that okay to say? <laughs> and, uh, so, so I, one thing that that I um, I noticed that in your presentation was about your um, the animal behavior. <laughs> I never even thought of that. So, I uh, I was wondering. Um, well, obviously, animals are not gonna animals or creatures are not gonna know to to wear special glasses. Maybe if someone could train a pet, they could. If they have a pet, they could put the glasses on them. Uh, are there certain animals that either have gone blind or have been known to actually watch the eclipse like a human does? Uh, okay, it's a it's a great it's a great question. Um, th thank you, Todd. Yeah. So, uh, animals don't look up at the sun, and they don't they don't look at the partially eclipsed sun, and they don't go blind. That 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 will not happen. But what they do is they react to the diminution in the light. They think that night is coming. So in fact, cows will go back to the barn. That has been observed. I was at an eclipse where I saw a bird that was flying and it was caught in midair just as totality began. The bird became very confused and wheeled around in the sky. It was dark. The bird was unsure what to do. It went into a tree and was squawking loudly. So those are the kinds of animal behaviors that can be observed. And members of this club work a lot with birds 
animals, reptiles, and insects. So, in fact, many people on the call here tonight may want to, in fact, set up some experiments to observe animals. Thank you for the question. And uh, while we're here, Iola, would you like to ask your question? To take a photograph, if you have a camera that has one of those viewfinders that flips out on the side, so you're not looking through the eyepiece, it, it, it seems to me that it should be okay to aim it generally and then kind of orient the camera, but looking only at that side um, on a little screen. Sure, I understand. You won't damage your, your vision by looking <laughs> at the screen, but you may damage the camera. You see, if you if you point the camera at the sun without a filter on the front of the camera, you're allowing the direct sunlight to enter the camera and it will hit the light sensitive uh, material in the camera, the electronic material. Mm -hmm. So you, you can severely damage the camera and ruin the camera. What you have to do is get an appropriate filter to put over the camera take your pictures of the partial phases that way but at totality you don't need any filter on the camera at all you should not have any filter at all on the camera so i advise you to go go to the website that will be in the handout and that will give you all kinds of advice on how to take pictures and i, I wish you the best i'm sure you'll do very well i'm, I'm going to brockville good for you Good for you. You will get, uh, I believe, close to three minutes of total eclipse at Brockville. All right. So um, I don't know, uh, Howard, if you have every Saros, uh memorized, but uh, do you remember if there was maybe an annular eclipse in Ottawa in the late 80s or early 90s? Because Barb Clute remembers a point there where it got very dark and eerie. Well, Barb, your your memory is very good. I, I'm almost positive that was the eclipse of May 10th, 1994. It was an annular. And I was in Toledo, Ohio, on the central line of that annular eclipse. And in Ottawa, I'm thinking it, it might have been 60% partial, maybe more, maybe more, because the path of annularity went over Syracuse, New York. So it might have been as much as 85 or 90% partial. I'm sure that's the one that you're thinking of. Now, just to go back to the first question, criteria for where I would travel, I would travel within North America for an annular eclipse. I would not go to Australia for an annular eclipse. So that's another factor. I've been to several annulars within North America. And it's a very good question, Barb. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. Um, Barb also had a comment that Annie Dillard's short story, Total Eclipse, is a great description of her experience um, in teaching a stone to talk. And a couple of people owned the Switched on Bach album. So, uh, yeah, that's that's known. That's great. Um, uh, back to the, the live questions. Uh, Guy or Guy, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi, thank you. An excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. I'm lucky enough to live here in Kingston, so I'm hoping for great weather. I'm wondering if Howard could describe exactly what sort of camera and uh, what focal length lens he has used most successfully. I've got a full frame camera with a new 600 millimeter lens and thinking that when I get my filter sometime this week, I'll be able to get a good shot. Sure. That's, again, a very good question. So I'm using a 400 millimeter lens. On occasion, I've used a doubler, so I get 800 millimeters with, with the camera. But, but, you know, that's almost too much because with 800 millimeters, you can't fit the whole corona in the frame. The 400 or the 600 that you're going to use will give you a, a very good image size. You will get very beautiful pictures with it. And I think you'll be fine. I'm using a single lens reflex and a 400 millimeter. My camera is a Nikon, but that doesn't matter. Any camera will work. And it's very forgiving. 
almost any exposure that you use within limits will give you some kind of an interesting picture, either very little corona or a lot of corona. So you, you want to take different exposures and see what you get. Follow the advice given on the websites. But again, Guy, please don't spend the entire time taking pictures. Please take the time to take it in and enjoy it and remember it. Thank you for the question. All right. Um, Martha, you're on deck, but first I just want to read this one from the comments. Um, how can you tell exactly when totality is happening to take off the glasses? Yeah, that, that's a great question again. It's very important. So picture that you are using the glasses and the sun is almost completely covered. You will see a very, very thin crescent sun through the glasses. The crescent will get smaller and smaller and smaller. And when the crescent disappears, take off the glasses because the eclipse is total. It's as simple as that. When you can't see anything through the glasses, take them off. You will be fine. All right. Um, Martha, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, hi. That was really excellent, Howard. I just have a um, sort of a question about your experience. How do you find it when you're in a big crowd or if you're solitary, if you're watching an eclipse? Like, how, like how do you gauge the experience? You know, I, I've done it both ways. I've been with very small groups of maybe three or four people. And at the recent eclipse, one and a half thousand. In Mexico, I will be with one and a half thousand people again. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different experience. When you're with a large crowd, you, you, feel, you feel the emotion. You feel the reaction. Something else that I, I also feel is how fortunate we are to be able to know when and where this is going to happen. I feel that every time. Thousands of years ago, people had no idea. The eclipse took them completely by surprise. We know right to the second when it's going to occur in the eclipse path. So I feel grateful for the knowledge, the scientific and mathematical knowledge that we have to be able to predict the event. But I'm also grateful for the beauty of the experience. So maybe that's the best way I could answer your question. And I, I think it's a wonderful question. Thank you, Martha. And I'm glad to meet you, you know, face to face on Zoom. We've communicated over the years. I think it's the first time we've actually been together on the same call. So thank you. I will be in Texas, actually, so I wasn't that happy with your 60% chance of clouds, but uh, looking forward to it. Good luck. Thank you. All right. So um, we have a question uh, from John about where you would find suitable glasses for kids. I'm guessing the links in the handout will be the way to go. Yeah, the links in the handout, the Ottawa Public Library home hardware. Now, someone mentioned in the chat, you can also use welder's glass. So I'm holding welder's glass number 14. That's critical. Number 14. I've taken this piece of glass to a number of eclipses. It's perfectly safe to use this during the partial phases. In Ottawa, there are welding supply companies. They're probably selling these like hotcakes. So mm -hmm. again, you can, if you can't get the glasses, call a welding supply company and get some welding glass number 14. And so just to, to repeat in, give me a couple of days, but we're going to post the, the handouts that Howard is uh, referencing on the website uh, as soon as we can after this. Um, yeah. And then uh, last question, it, how did you become interested in eclipses in the first place? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question as well. <laughs> well, you know, we all, I, I could almost ask all of you, how did you become interested in nature? There must have been some event, probably when you were quite young, where you learned something about a plant or an insect or a bird, or maybe you had a role model or a mentor, or maybe your parents introduced you to the subject, or maybe you had a moment in one of your courses in biology that generated your interest. In my case, I was less than seven years old, and my parents gave me a book called The Golden Book of Astronomy. I still have the book. It's on my bookshelf right behind me. And in that book, there was a section on eclipses of the sun. It explained what they were. It showed the tracks of eclipses across North America and the world. I was six years old. And I said, you know, one day I have to see a total eclipse of the sun. That was the beginning of my interest. And the first one I saw was March 7th, 1970. And once you've seen one, <laughs> you want to see another and another and another. And that's what I've been doing for the past 54 years, trying to see as many as possible, taking fewer pictures and just enjoying them. So that's the answer to that question. I'll just go back to one thing about the glasses and the welder's glass. If you cannot get glasses or welder's glass, you can always make that pinhole camera which will be in the handout, or you can Google how to make one, but it will be in the handout. And that is a perfectly safe and simple way to observe the partial phases of the eclipse. So do not despair if you can't get a filter. You can always use that. And when the eclipse is total, look directly at the totally eclipsed sun and you will be fine. Jacob, I think Guy has another question. I think so. Go ahead. Um, I too remember Wendy Carlos and switched on Bach, but I have a copy of Golden Astronomy. That is that is <laughs> that, that is exactly the book. That is the book I have behind me in the bookshelf. Yeah, we're probably of similar vintage, although I may beat you by a few years. But yeah, yay <laughs> astronomy, yay, uh, yay all these great things. Yeah, that th that is the book, and I'm ever grateful to my late parents for giving me the book which started my interest in astronomy. Yeah, I got it from my dad too. Well done, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase a comment from Barb in the comments. Yay, being excited about nature and natural events. Um, yeah, and, and not just what's on TikTok, right? So um, it's great that um, we're all here uh, being interested in, and passionate about the real world in which we live. And uh, thank you very much, Howard, for taking the time uh, to spend your evening giving us this presentation. Um, this was fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, it is it is truly been my thanks. pleasure. Th thank you. Thank you all very much. Good luck and have a wonderful experience on April the 8th. Thanks to all of you. Thank you.